Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Open Up the Workforce, where we speak with leaders driving the future of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. Today, we have an exciting episode in store for you. I'm joined by Flora Stanfield, the Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer at Vitesco Technologies, a tier one supplier for the mobility industry that's focused on clean energy and has 40,000 employees around the world. Flora has had an incredible experience and background in the world of HR with over 22 years of experience driving change and celebrating diversity. We're excited to have you on the show today. Flora, can you please tell our listeners a little bit more about your background and what's led you to your current role? Absolutely. Thank you very much for that intro. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. So the first thing that I would add to everything that you just said is that I am not American. I was born and raised in South America. Uh, I spent, yeah, about 15 years of my professional experience managing Latin American countries. English is therefore my, not my first language, so I apologize for the maybe the verbal typos that I may have or even like the accent. So yes, um, I started my career in Uruguay, then Argentina, and then other countries in Latin America. And I've always been very passionate about driving organizations towards becoming more people-centric because at least what I believe is that if you take care of your people, will take care of business, right? So there's a very direct connection between what I'm doing today in the area of D&I and culture and who we want to be as a company in the future, right? So that's my passion. That's what kind of makes me be excited about what I do today. Thank you for sharing. I couldn't agree more with what you said. At Civa, we call it a symbiotic relationship. When you gain value, they gain value. And we love your global background. We don't apologize for accents here. We celebrate them and we appreciate the different experiences and langu- languages that bring people bring to the table at our team almost every single person can speak multiple languages so it's wonderful to hear more about your background Uh, what has really made you passionate about this field of diversity equity inclusion and also on a global scale when we think about all the different teams you manage I think that's really fascinating for us. Well, I think I gave you kind of a little bit of a glimpse in, in the previous, with a previous question. I think that what's interesting about diversity, equity, and inclusion is that it touches, let's say, a very specific domain within the HR field that has to do basically with human behavior, right, and emotions. Because when you talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, you're talking about how do you make an organization people-centric? And what does that mean? Because we hear like people-centricity all the time, right? But what does that really mean? It means that you need to have leaders that are great, that know their people, see their people, and give their people what they need to be successful, right? You need to have a culture of inclusion where people feel that they have a voice, that they're seen, that they can speak up, that they can be themselves, that they don't need to leave their identity at the door when we when they come to work. And you need to have like policies and structures and procedures and systems that actually support that, right? So I think it's a very interesting aspect of HR. And if you ask me, I think it's kind of the future of HR because a lot of the things that HR does today are eventually going to be taken over by technology, right? That's kind of the nature of things, the nature of how we're how, where we're going in terms of of kind of professions like like HR, but the one thing that technology will never be able to take over is the emotional side of it, right? How do we manage people in their full self, not only their performative part, right? So I think that's what drove me to D and I because I, I definitely think it's it's an area it's kind of probably the future. It may be with different acronyms of or, or different words, right? But it is definitely the future of how we're going to be managing people into the 22nd century. I'm totally in line with what you just shared. And I I believe in so many ways that it is the future. And I get excited about how we can encourage these systems and build them. But I also know that when the media and what we're seeing with legislation has recently created a lot of uncertainty. And you've been in this industry for two decades, so you've seen a lot of change and You've seen teams bounce back and develop and design. I'd love to get your perspective on what's happening right now and how does DE&I play a role in that in today's world? Yeah. 
Well, I would say that as in everything, there's always trends, right? So there's always ups and flows in these type of things. And there's always one theory that comes out and it's like everybody follows. And then there's another one that comes out and everybody decides to drop the previous one because the new one is kind of more interesting or something. So I think that this is part of that market ebbs and flows in the kind of the HR, D&I field. So first thing that I would say is no panic, right? I don't think there's any reason to panic. The one thing that I would think about or suggest our listeners here is to think, what are you doing with your D&I, let's say, activities? Are they just like a tech the box? We need to do unconscious bias training. We need to have X amount of ear teeth and that's that. Because I mean, if that is what you're doing, well, then maybe there may be some leaders in your company that say there's no value added here. We're just spending money and there's nothing that we're getting in return, right? And I could actually understand that. And I could actually understand companies saying, you know what? We're going to cut up on our investment. We're not going to do this anymore because it doesn't make any sense. We haven't made a lot of progress anyway, right? But if you think of D and I as actually an enabler and a catalyst of a desired culture that you want to build or that you want to manage because culture will happen anyway, so you'd rather manage it than not, right? Then it becomes a different story because then D and I and culture become so intertwined that you can actually probably speak in, in kind of synonym way between like what DNI does and what culture means for a company. And it is an enabler, it is an accelerator. Everything you do with DNI, if it is not, let's say, performative to just check a box, has an impact on behavior, has an impact in the way people communicate, has an impact in the way people relate to each other, and at the end of the day, has an impact in the business results, right? So if you think about DNI in the long term, ask your enabler to develop and sustain a desired culture, then everything you're doing still makes sense. doesn't matter what the markets are doing, right? So you need to stick to it and you need to be bold to say, you know what, whatever's happening out there, whatever is being stated by the Supreme Court, it doesn't matter. My effort means something to me because they're helping me in building the company that I want to have. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. And I think that it paints a really important picture for the role that DNI leaders have that not to panic or be so reactive to legislation that might come through because as an organization, you can still lay down your own principles. You can still create so many guardrails and things in place that even if legislation says one thing, your team has the opportunity to become thoughtful about how you respond without a reactive panic. So I really appreciate that guidance. I absolutely think that Anything that you can do as a company that doesn't, of course, doesn't break the law, but just enhances our ability to think different, to do different, to be more innovative, to be, again, to bring better outcomes, there, there shouldn't be any law against that, right? And that, that I think, is where D&I can be, even, again, renamed if you want to, but still add a lot of value. Yes. And I love that you said renamed. And we even just talked a little bit earlier about the function of HR. And this is something I grapple with all the time, because to me... HR isn't siloed or isolated. It's literally everything. DNI is everything. It's at the basis and the foundation. And so as a DI leader, I'm always amazed by how much cross-functional work that you do, how much alignment you need to build. And at the core of that, I truly believe trust is so critical and important. And so I'd love to get your perspective on how you build an honest, transparent culture so you can partner up effectively with the teams you collaborate with. Yeah, I totally agree that trust is the, let's say, the foundation for everything you do. And for me, trust has to do with a couple of things. First, being myself and being transparent and being honest and acknowledging my own imperfections and my own faults because I'm human and I have 150,000 imperfections. I'm not perfect. Someone once told me a while ago that because I was in D and I needed to be held to higher standards and I was like, why? If I'm just human like you, right? So first thing is acknowledging that I'm imperfect and being honest in myself, my true self, and sharing that with people because that lowers the guards of everybody. If, you know, the DNI person that's leading all of our cultural efforts, our inclusion efforts, is allowed to, to make mistakes, then I am allowed to make mistakes, right? And I think that's really important. And the other thing that builds trust is, for me, consistency and honoring your word, right? So if you're gonna if you're gonna do something, do it. 
if you, if you say that you're going to do it, because otherwise you again become this performative kind of, I don't know, tech the box, look nice in the picture type of function or field. And that's not what we want. So if we're going to say, we're, we say that we're going to be doing something, we need to do it. And it's important again, to build those relationships with your critical stakeholders, because as we both probably know, d and I is also a function that is generally very scarce with, in terms of resources. So we need to get things done through others, right? Like the, our influence and skills need to be very high because we need to kind of convince people that this is the way to go, this is the direction and have a bunch of people doing things that may be out of their job description, you know, out of their eight to five type of job to just follow us because they see the value or they see where we want to go. So consistency and delivering and showing that vision, but also being able to move the organization towards that vision and honoring your word are critical for me to build that trust. If you don't show where you want to go, but then deliver in that same direction, then, you know, your efforts are going to be seen as, okay, this is very nice. It's, it's nice for the outside, but I don't see anything inside happening that's actually changing. I love what you shared. There's so many great elements that I want to unpack. And I think the first one that you talked about was the fact that you set the tone that you can make mistakes. And when we talk about d and I, I think that sometimes I've noticed there's some fear that I can't get this wrong. I need to say the right things. And sometimes that fear inhibits people from actually having the dialogue and speaking up. Are there any like key examples or ways that you communicate that with people? Or is it just at the beginning of the meeting, you kind of share that to, to break the ice? We'd love to know how you actually manifest that communication with the team. Well, I mean, I when I realized that I made a mistake, I asked for forgiveness, like to start with. I personally have a very tough time with pronouns that are not he or she, I'll be honest with you. So, I, I and it's because English is not my first language. So I really have a, a hard time with different pronouns and I acknowledge that, right? So, I think that when they're, you know, honest mistake because of ignorance, because you didn't, you didn't think what you were saying, and you recognize and you apologize and you ask the person that, you know, the comment or the mistake was referring to, what would be the right way to do this? And you, you learn in the process, there's no harm. Nobody can be offended if somebody makes a mistake, recognizes a mistake and asks for a learning opportunity, right? I think that mistakes are great learning opportunities. And if we consider that, again, we're all imperfect, we're all going to make mistakes at some point, but we can learn from them and try not to repeat them then it's okay, right? We need to kind of lighten up the practice of DEI because DEI is not about being afraid of, of saying, of sharing, of connecting. It's quite the opposite. But I mean, mistakes are going to happen and it's all right. As long as we catch them and we try not to make them again, we're human. Mistakes happen in all fields of life, right? So I would say that, of course, there's a difference between like an honest mistake when somebody is, prefers to be referred by they and I call them he or she, I apologize and I may make the mistake again because of my language and I acknowledge that, right? But there is a thin line between an honest mistake and this like, you know, let's say fluidity and comfort and having an honest conversation and like the microaggressions that may happen at work. So that is a different topic and maybe for a different episode in, in, in your podcast, but Definitely, let's not be afraid of being ourselves. Let's be fresh. Let's be honest. Let's ask for forgiveness if we make if we make one. Let's ask for a learning opportunity and keep going, right? Because this is the beauty of this practice. It, it's human nature that we're dealing here with here, right? So that's such powerful guidance. It reminds me of one of my favorite quotes from Maya Angelou: "says Do the best you can until you know better. Then, when you know better, do better." And that kind of really resonates with what you're sharing as we grow and develop in this practice. And the only way that can happen is through that dialogue, is through that humility and being able to have those conversations. I appreciate you for sharing this. I'd love to shift gears a little bit and learn a little bit more about how you've designed your global employee resource group program, because I've learned that employee resource groups, as we go global, sometimes the participation can be different in different countries. So I'd love to get your perspective on how you've been able to manifest that in a global scale and how those programs are set up for success. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. And actually, 
nobody has the perfect recipe on how to have global ERD. I'll be honest with you. So we're just kind of one company that's trying hard to, to be successful in this particular arena. We do have nine ERG, five of them are global and four of them are local to the United States or the Americas, let's say. The five that are global, I mean, and this is also part of what we were talking about, meeting people where they're at, being candid, being honest, accepting imperfections. And ERG need to be also a reflection of our humanity, right? So we cannot have a one-size-fits-all. And diversity, by definition, it's going to be different in different countries or even in different regions in the same country, right? So when we think about ERGs being these congregations of employees that find a commonality in one identity trait that brings them together, right? That commonality may be different in different parts of the world, right? So um, this is uh, some things that I've learned in my own personal journey of having global ERGs. In China, for example, if you are a multi-children family, you are diverse you're part of a minority. So that that makes sense in the term in terms of having people that have more than one kid coming together and sharing what are the challenges and the experiences they have because they have a multi children. And that's something we in the Western world we wouldn't ever think of, right? As a topic to for an ERG. And there's multiple examples in the same direction. So I think that the capacity to understand that diversity means different things in different contexts. It's critical to have successful ERGs. Either they're global ones, like you could have our LGBTQ plus ERG, or the women or gender based ERG, or disability ERG, or whatever. There may be some that are like common to the whole world, but there are others that you need to respect that may come up in countries where there's dimensions of diversity you haven't thought of, right? And that's one thing that enables you to have a successful ERG strategy. And the other thing that I would say is important is for your global ERG is to work closely, have a global, let's say, kind of headquarter or, or, or leadership team that defines strategy in terms of, okay, what are going to be the pillars of the things that we're going to be addressing as, from an ERG perspective? And then building chapters, either regionally or locally or site-based or whatever, that interpret those guidelines and then apply them locally to what makes sense, sense to their audiences or populations. So global ERGs need to set direction, but then it's the local chapters, either for countries, regions, or sites, or whatever, that implement and execute. And they, ad they adjust to what their people need, right? Because otherwise, what's the point in having them? I think that one of the challenges that global ERGs have is always the kind of identifying who can be the leaders in the different countries, building up the chapters with strong leadership teams within the chapters, and then the amplification of membership around the world, right? Like, how do you go out, spread the word, invite people to join? And that's always a challenge. But at the end of the day, they're super valuable for the business. And I've seen many cases of business leaders asking the ERGs to help in different topics, right? related to customers, related to products, related to policies, to benefits, you name it, right? So um, definitely value adding, but definitely also challenging because at the end of the day, we're talking people that have a day job doing something on top of their day job that they're passionate about. So again, my recommendation would always be find that passion, find the people that want to do something to change the world. And those are going to be the people that are going to help you change the world, right? through the ERD or whatever other commitment they can commit to in, in the DNI field. Yes. And I always find this so fascinating as I studied human rights in London and I had actually about 60 students in the program and I was one of few Americans that were represented and we talked about these issues and everyone represented their respective countries. And I always, it really opened up my mind because at the time being based where I was, I, I kind of saw my world, my bubble. And I went to a new bigger bubble and I feel like I was really, it was really insightful to think through all of this and how does cultural intelligence play into how we communicate and how we celebrate diversity effectively? Because what might offend me might have not meant to offend somebody, but there could have been language barrier. There's just so many factors that I think that these employee resource groups can break down. You mentioned at the beginning that, and I feel like a lot of our listeners will resonate with this, that 
there aren't that enough resources for diversity yeah. and that resources are scarce. So how you get resources to invest in initiatives like ERGs or other initiatives that you're working on? That's a good question. <laughs> yeah, I will really don't really question. Yes. It's a hard one. I mean, it, there's again, there's not a recipe that I would I could be able to share with anyone that would be okay if you do this, you're going to be successful. What I can tell you is my own personal story, and I would say that the way that I don't have a lot. I mean, I, we have a population of forty thousand people, and we don't have a huge D and I team. We're three people in our D and I team. I'll be honest with you. So it's not that I'm super successful in having 150 resources for my field. But we do a lot of work, and I think this is what we have been doing well in connecting and building, again, super strong relationships with our leaders. So I do it at executive board level with our CEO, with the head, the head of business for our different businesses, our heads of regions, et cetera. So they believe that what we're doing is meaningful. And by doing that, they enable their people to participate in the initiatives that we're sponsoring or we're executing. So I think the first step when you're struggling with having kind of full-time resources is find your allies outside of your own discipline. Find people that believe in the cause and want to help. And the way that they can help with is by enabling others to dedicate time to, to push the cause forward, right? So that's one way, and I think that's critical. And then, again, I will refer to a comment that I, meant, yeah, I made a minute ago, which is find people's passion. Like when we're talking about ERG, we're talking about something that, yes, it's beyond kind of the regular normal scope of work, but it has to do with, with something that's very personal generally, right? So someone that wants to, to participate in the LGBTQ ERG or the people with disabilities ERG or the intergenerational ERG, whatever, whatever one you have, doesn't matter. It's because there's something inside of them that actually connects them with that topic, right? So find what is that little internal sparkle that people have, that topic that's close to their heart because they have a family member that's part of that community because they are struggling and they don't know how to connect with others that are part of the community and this is an opportunity for them to feel they belong to the organization and be closer to others like them for whatever reason because they want to contribute to make the organization a better one a fairer one the world a better world right there's a little bit of let's say altruism also in in working with ERG so talk to people get to know get to know people get to know what moves them and ask them to join and I mean, it's as easy as that. If you get to know your people and you know your people, it's easy to ask them to help you in, in moving the organization towards this desired culture that, that you may want to have. So a lot of work around showing the light at the end of the tunnel and a lot of work on having people saying, hey, you know what, I'm supporting, this makes sense, and I'm going to help in whichever way I can. So... Yeah, formal resources are not going to be easy to find. I think that's going to be one of the, the let's say, that the baselines of our practice. But if you have good, let's say, let's say, I, I can't say inspirational skills because that's not the word, but if you are good at showing that direction, right, and influencing people in a good way to help you out, then the road ahead is not that difficult. You just need to do the, the hard work of influencing and showing that direction. That's incredibly inspiring. And I, when I, Don, I saw early in your career, you worked on designing training plans and supporting middle managers, which I feel like middle managers are so, so important in the development process and learning about people. So I think what you shared is really powerful. And I would urge companies to do that, to take time to listen, learn, to empower their workforce as they're growing. I'd also love to tap into a little bit about your industry. And we're excited that there's a lot more of a spotlight into clean energy and especially investment in hopefully new talent development strategies for the mobile industry. We've seen a lot of legislation and initiative with the Good Jobs Initiative and others. How are you maybe attracting diverse talent to your workforce and ensuring that they feel welcomed. Yeah, it's an interesting mo I mean, there's always gonna be a war for talent. Again, that's kind of one of those lines that you read and you hear all the time. 
I think that the automotive industry that I'm part of is going through kind of a transformation today, moving from the traditional internal combustion engine to electrification. And I think that's one of the hot spots for us is that we work on electrification. Where when we say that we power clean mobility, what we're saying is basically we produce parts or cars that make either in internal combustion engine cars, traditional cars, cleaner, or we work with companies that are already producing electric vehicles and producing the systems and the, and the, and the parts for those electric vehicles. So we are contributing in, in the, for the whole industry, right? Understanding that the industry is migrating to a, towards electrification and we're part of that journey. So I think that the core of what we do is already interesting and inspiring for many engineers and technical people, software engineers, electric engineers, mechanical engineers that would be coming out of college or starting or trying to find where to fit in the workforce. Because we are doing something that's clean, that's helping our planet be cleaner, and we're kind of proud of that, right? That's per se a benefit because we are a cool company in a cool industry in that sense, right? Uh, The automotive industry overall is still... I know we are in the middle of that transformation, but it it is still a pretty much traditional industry. So we're trying to push in the right direction to kind of accelerate some processes. And I think that the opportunity that tier one suppliers like ourselves have is that we're not 300,000 employees type of company, so we can move a little faster, right? So again, the nature of what we do is exciting. It's interesting. It's automotive. Automotive is a, one of the flagship industries of this country. So that's also something that's attractive. And I would say that a couple of the things that we do that are pretty cool, we do have a couple of programs like apprenticeship, internship, working student programs, depending on the country, we have different versions of that. And that is a great way to get connected and acquainted with us. And we do have a lot of really interesting really interesting profiles and positions that students or recent grads can come and apply for. And I would say that the one of the great things that we do in, to be able to attract people is that we are very approachable. Our leaders are approachable. You want to talk to the head of R&D, find him on LinkedIn, I'll give you his phone number, you can call him, you can send him a text, he's going to respond, you're going to have a conversation like, we are a team of leaders that are super approachable. And I think also that attends to the culture, right? Younger generations want to be part of companies that are helping or sustain, helping sustainability and helping the environment. They want to work in companies where they have a voice, but they can be heard. They want to work with leaders where, who they can learn from. So I think that we're offering all of this. And I think that our biggest challenge today is that we're still a brand that is not necessarily that well known. We're not one of these like cool, big kind of tech companies that everybody knows about that come to your mind firsthand. We're still in a, at a very early stage. We're only two years old as a company. But I think that we, with time, we're going to get to that point when you think of tech companies, especially related to sustainable markets and the auto industry, we're going to be top of mind. And I think all of this is a great combo that we're trying to build to be attractive to talent. And, and I think that we're doing a good job. Still a long journey and a long road ahead, but we got three neat ingredients to, to get there. I couldn't agree more. I saw that you recently launched your North America Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Report and love seeing the impact that you shared. I also am excited that you have a woman CEO. I read Sandy's Forward and yours as well. It's really inspiring and love that, you know, not only are you celebrating thinking about diversity, equity, inclusion in your workforce. But like you said, you are inherently doing so much good for the world through clean energy. And that's what younger generation is all about and very inspired to to be a part of. I'd love to wrap up today's conversation with a question that we always ask our speakers on this show, and it's around our mission. Our tagline at Zimba is open up the workforce. And as a social impact company to us, that means a future workforce that supports an equitable access to jobs and wealth creation. We'd love to ask you, Flora, what do you believe are the next steps that leaders need to take in order to truly open up the workforce? 
I think that's a really good question. I think that companies, and there's some that are already doing it and I celebrate it. Companies need to be a lot more fluid and fast in the way that they're opening up job positions and opening up for talent to come in. I think there's a structural problem still with companies, and I'm talking companies, not leaders, as you asked, just because I think that the problem is more structural than leader, leader based. Uh, I think that as long as we, we as companies need to go through the whole processes of getting positions approved, positions posted, a certain amount of people interviewed for a job and shortlisted and et cetera, et cetera, we are going to be kind of and holding our own selves. We need to be a lot more creative in the way that we're reaching out to markets and to people. We need to be a lot more open and flexible in the way that we're bringing in people. And by that, I mean hiring on the spot in job fair, hiring whole groups of, of teammates in college to work on a specific project. Like there's so many things that we could do different as corporate America to be, to open up the workforce, as you were saying. And I think that we're still struggling with our status quo and the processes that we have. And very few companies are already kind of like leading the path in this kind of more innovative, more flexible type of bringing in more talent, bringing in people to the company. So I think there's still a long journey ahead of us in that direction. The good thing is that we know (laughs) it would be worth it. We didn't know that we had a problem, right? We do know that we have an issue and a challenge and the years ahead of us are going to show that a lot clearer than today and I hope that we can challenge ourselves to to become that those type of employers that we know the next generations want and that also has to do with the way that we're hiring and bringing our talent into the company. Thank you that's such an inspirational note to lean on and I love your tagline as well that the future is electric and I feel like you've given us a lot of hope and a lot of honesty today in the conversation that we're on a journey, like you said, and mistakes will happen and things are not ideal. We need of a lot of work to do, but there is a bright future. And if we lean in, we can make strides in the right direction. With that, Flora, is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience before we wrap up today? I just want to thank you for the time. I'm happy to help if anybody would like to reach out. I'm very active on LinkedIn. I, I am Florencia Danfield on LinkedIn. If anybody wants to connect, happy to do that. Happy to help. Happy to have these conversations. And again, I mean, we, with our little efforts, each of us, we are changing the world. So let's keep at it. Together, we're unstoppable. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Flora. It was great to have you on. Thank you very much. Thank you.